as we continue worshiping this morning, I want to remind everybody what Catalyst is about. We at our church are about one thing, and that is loving people to life change in Christ. So whether you are worshiping with us here in our sanctuary this morning, or whether you are joining us via our live stream online on Facebook or YouTube, we love you. But as a church, we love you enough to tell you the truth. I don't want you to stay the same. Our whole church's mission is that day by day, step by step, we each change to become more like Christ. And one of the ways we do that is through the studying of his word together. Now, I forgot my bulletin in the back of the room, so somebody help me. Somebody hold up a bulletin. So on the front of that bulletin, that's the code for your Connect card. But if you turn and look at the very back of it, so today is an interactive sermon series. That means we are going to interact this morning. Thank you. There's a square code right here. And I want you to go ahead and scan that code with your phone as we get ready for our message this morning. Um, we are going to be continuing our series, Walking Through Revelation, and you are going to be able to scan and ask any question you want about the chapter that we are looking at. If you are joining us online, obviously you don't have one of our actual printed church bulletins, but you can see the text at the bottom of your screen right there. It says c302.us slash ask, c302.us slash ask. If you will enter in that code, now even if you're in the room, you should want to go to your web browser, type that in, it's still going to take you to the same place. It's going to take you to our online course question form, as I am going through the text of Revelation today, you can ask any question that you want. It'll be received in the back. They will text it to me up here. I've got my phone right here. My wife will text me the questions as they come in, and we will roll those questions into our exploration of this chapter. Also, inside your bulletin, for those of you who are here in the room, Inside your bulletin, there is a separate sheet handout. We've been doing these each week. These are your study notes. If you happen to miss a week and you want to go back and get the study notes for each week, they are on one of the tables out there in the lobby each week. So when you're done, you, you'd be able to have all, a full outline, or at least my outline, of the book of Revelation and the way it works. So um, make sure you, you keep your study sheet. Make sure you scan your code. While you're doing all of that, let me give you the key thought that gets us into the book of Revelation. Revelation is about the fulfillment of God's outstanding promises. Creation will be free from the presence of, the effects of, and the desire to sin forever. All of my Sandlot friends, forever. The entire purpose of the book of Revelation is to bring to a fantastically dramatic spiritual close the first 65 books of the Bible. To attempt to read Revelation apart from the first 65 books of the Bible is to take it out of its context. And so if you're, if you're wondering what the, the proper frame is, I tell people all the time when you put a puzzle together, right? I love that. Wait. It's the fan on my mic, but it sounds really dramatic. All of a sudden, I'm like, that's God. No, it's not God. It's just a fan. But it's really hot up here, and I'm wearing a sweater. So just roll with me. The frame for the book of Revelation is the four outstanding promises of Scripture. All those are in the notes out there in the lobby. If you have questions about that, please hit me up, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Today, we are going to look at, and, and I'll be honest, it's going to be a pretty... Um, I don't know. It's pretty interesting. Those of you who've been hanging with us, we, 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 we did the history part. We did the weird. And now we're going to get to probably the meaty parts where there's going to be some pretty big questions. Um, so just to review as a reminder, the book of Revelation was written by the Apostle John. He's the same dude that wrote the Gospel of John. He also wrote the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote Revelation while exiled on the island of Patmos. He was sent there by Roman Emperor... Domitian. Yep, by Roman Emperor Domitian, 85, 85 95, 96. Uh, if you're interested in the debate of whether uh, John was under Nero or Domitian, that was in, I think, week one. We talked about the evidence for why the Domitian time period fits the book better than, than the um, Neuronic time period. Key verse for interpreting Revelation is Revelation chapter 1, verse 19. Write, therefore, about what you have seen, what is now, and what will take place. From John's perspective, what was past wasn't present, what is future. Since we're living after John wrote, then both John's past and John's present are past to us, but there's still some stuff that's in the future. 
And then you can see here, I've outlined chapter 13 for you. Um, we're going to be looking at the calling of the first beast, which is also called the Antichrist, the worship of the Antichrist, the authority of the Antichrist. Then there's this cool little calling of endurance for faithful people. And then there's another beast who's also called the false prophet. He's also called a lot of other things. Um, and then the leading of the worship of the Antichrist. And then ultimately we're going to get to the mark of the beast, the number 666. These are a lot of those typical revelation themes, which is why we're only doing this chapter today. We had communion. We've got one big chapter. And if, if I don't keep to my time limit, the children's workers downstairs get very upset at Pastor Bill. So we want to make sure everybody leaves church happy today. So first, let's read Revelation chapter 13, and then we're going to go back and we're going to break down the symbols and, and start going through our questions. So here we go. Revelation chapter 13, starting in verse 1. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea, and I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with 10 crowns on its horns and each head had a blasphemous or on each head a blasphemous name the beast i saw resembled a leopard and had the feet of those of a bear and the mouth like that of a lion the dragon gave the beast his power and his throne and great authority one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound but the fatal wound had been healed the whole world was filled with wonder and followed the beast. People worshiped the dragon because the, uh, he had given authority to the beast, and they also worshiped the beast and asked, Who is like the beast? Who can wage war against it? The beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and exercise its authority for 42 months. It opened its mouth to blaspheme God and to slander his name and his dwelling place and those uh, who live in heaven. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And it was given authority over every tribe, people, language, and nation. All inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast, all whose names have not been written in the Lamb's book of life, the Lamb who was slain from the creation of the world. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Verse 10. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword they will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Verse 11. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. It exercised all authority of the first beast on its behalf and made the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound had been healed. And it performed great signs, even causing fire to come down from heaven to the earth in full view of the people. Because of the signs it was given, power to perform on behalf of the first beast, it deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The second beast was given power to um, give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. It also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast for the number uh, is the number of man. That number is 666. So I don't know about you, but that feels like just completely and totally normal and we should just move on. This is one of the challenges with this book is sometimes you really got to slow it down and we got to, you know, reframe and remember a few things. So let's, let's pick up, let's go back to verse one and, and we got to remind ourselves who the characters are, what's happening, what happened last week. Well, last week we saw the dragon character appear. We had the dragon, we had the woman, we had the child. The child is Jesus, the woman is Israel, the dragon is Satan. So when we get to 13, 13 is building on the dragon character from 12. So the dragon is Satan. The dragon is the evil one, the uh, Satan, who is the deceiver, the accuser of the brethren, all those words. He's the uber bad devil character in the Bible. That's the dragon. The dragon stood on the shore of the sea. 
You remember in the last chapter when we talked about that he had one, the angel had one foot on the land and one foot on the sea? So now the dragon is in the same place. What is that showing? It's showing that Unitarian authority over everything. He stood on the shore of the sea, and then I saw a beast coming out of the sea. It had ten horns and seven heads with ten crowns, and, and on each had a blasphemous name. So there are two different beasts who will be revealed in this chapter. Now keep in mind, John is a first century Jew in exile in, on, on Patmos, likely end of the AD 80s, early 90s, before he ultimately writes this vision down. And anything that he sees, he's seeing through the lens of the Spirit of God. And he's trying to explain it. So let's talk about what the first beast is. The first is this. We're not talking about a physical creature. Now, he may be seeing spiritually, just like, remember, when we went all the way back to chapter 6, we talked about the horsemen? They're not riding actual horses, right? Budweiser did not loan out the Clydesdales to Jesus so that the horsemen could ride the Clydesdales back out of heaven. What he's seeing is something in the spirit. He's seeing something in the spirit realm and he's describing it in words that a first century Jew would understand. And so he's picturing it as a horseman, as a warrior. So this beast is not an actual animal. So then you're going to ask me, well, how come in verse two, there are specific animals mentioned, the bear, the lion, the leopard? Great question. Thank you for asking. Interestingly enough, the leopard, the bear, and the lion are all references from Daniel chapter 7 in Daniel's prophetic dream of the end of the world, but the animals are listed in reverse order. So for those of you who want to go back there, you can go to Daniel chapter 6, chapter 7. That's Daniel's vision of the end of the world. So what is the beast? Um, The beast is really kind of like two things, um, and the best way I can explain it is We don't have a king in America, right? But Britain does. Britain has a king. The king is the figurehead of the British monarchy. But the king is not the monarchy itself, right? So in the same way that King Charles is the symbolic individual who represents the monarchy, but he isn't the whole monarchy itself. They have a house of lords, they have a house of commons, they have a citizenry, they have a royal, you know, all that other stuff. But if I were to refer to the power or the authority of King Charles, I'm really referring to the entire British monarchy. I'm referring to it through the personage of King Charles. Does that make sense? That's the way I want you to think about the Antichrist. The Antichrist is an individual human being who's used by Satan to do a job. But he's not an individual all by himself in the sense of all of his authority is only his. The Antichrist will lead a worldwide government. And so when we speak of the authority or the power of the Antichrist, we are talking about a worldwide government with an individual human figurehead. In the same way that Great Britain is a government who has a single figurehead. Or even in America, one could argue that the president, whoever happens to be holding the presidency, is the symbolic representative of our head of state. But, but even in our system of government, the president's not the king. You can't, he can't just do whatever he wants because we have Congress and you know, we have our, our legislation branch. So when we see this beast in, in, in verse 1, the beast with all the different heads... Um, and the, the crowns on the heads. This is a spiritual portrait of the worldwide government that the Antichrist will lead. And then when we see specifically the one head, and did you notice how two or three times the whole had a head wound and it was healed, had a head wound and it was healed? That's the individual Antichrist. Does that make sense? The Antichrist is a figurehead who represents a large world government. And so when we see the dragon stood on the shore of the sea and I saw a beast coming out of the sea, most of the time in Jewish apocalyptic literature, the sea represents the Gentile community. So when the beast arises from the sea, we are talking about a restored Roman Empire, a worldwide government on a Gentile base not a Jewish base. Why? Because at the end of this chapter, what Satan is really trying to set up is his own unholy trinity or, or, not, or false or non-godly trinity and his own world that worships him the way we're supposed to worship God. Like this whole thing is just Satan trying to represent himself. But the beast that's coming up out of the sea with the ten horns and the seven heads and the crowns 
Interestingly enough, those are crowns of authority, not crowns of victory. That's two different words in the Greek. One is a crown of authority, those who are in charge. One is a crown of victory, those who have run the good race, right? Remember when Paul says, run the race like you want to win? That's the crown of, that's the victor's crown. In the Olympics, they would give out the little crowns of, of leaves. Now we give out little gold coins. But you know what's on that gold coin? A crown of leaves, right? The symbolism from the original Olympics. And the original Olympics happened in Athens and in Corinth right at the same time this was all happening. So the crowns represent the authority of the nations that will comprise this one world um, government. Um, let, let's, and I'm not saying it's the United Nations. A lot of people have tried to make that accusation, and I think that's a little flawed. Um, but there will be a worldwide government that arises from a Gentile base, and there will be a single figurehead leader of that worldwide government, and that's the individual person that's the Antichrist. So does that make sense so far? Okay, so that's verse one. Then we get to verse two. I saw the beast resemble as a leopard, the uh, feet like those of the bear, the mouth like those of a lion. Those are all references charting back to D Daniel chapter seven when Daniel is seeing his own vision of the end of the world. Uh, maybe not a thousand years. How many years between Malachi and Matthew? 400. Plus 95 years is how much? 495. Plus another two to 300 years to get back from Malachi to Daniel. See, that's why I had to call it out. I'm not so good at math. Jim, what's 400 plus 95 plus 300? 795. That's right. Gold star for Jim, 795. Give or take 795 years from Daniel having his vision of the end of the world to John having his vision of the end of the world, and yet they're seeing the same three animals. Interestingly, they're seeing them in reverse order. I, I don't have a perfect reason for why they're seeing them in reverse order, um, but there's about you know, 795, 800 years in between the two of them. And then what's really important about verse 2, the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. Satan gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. So now we have to ask the question, what power, what throne, and what authority does Satan have that he is able to give? So easy question. Is Satan able to give God's authority? That's correct. No, he cannot. So what is it that Satan has authority over? The earth. So I heard the earth somewhere. Somebody said it. Satan has authority over the earth. Now, how do I know that? Because if we go all the way back to the book of Genesis, chapters 1 and 2, who was supposed to be God's regent, his ambassador, his representative on planet earth to lead earth in worshiping God? Who was it supposed to be? It's supposed to be Adam in conjunction with Eve. That's right. Don't forget Eve was there. They were, uh, the, the word in, in, in Hebrew, azer, does not mean subordinate helper. It means co-equal partner helper. Different roles, but same level. So Adam was supposed to be the regent representative. He was supposed to be the ambassador on earth to lead people into God. When Satan tempts Adam and Eve to sin and thereby question and disobey God, Satan usurps Adam's authority, and now Satan is in charge of planet earth which is why when we get all the way to the new testament and you go to the book of matthew and jesus gets baptized and immediately goes out to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil why because the second adam succeeds where the first adam fails which is why jesus being god now is not only has the authority of god but he retains the authority of adam as the correct regent on earth which is why satan Jesus can cast out demons and why he can do miracles. Why? Because he's not only God, he has brought back the authority that Adam should have had in the garden. I realize I'm jumping all around, but it's big picture stuff. And so the ADHD has got to connect the pictures. Okay? So what is the authority that Satan retains? Satan is the highest ranking spiritual being on our planet today. When he was cast out of heaven, he wasn't cast into hell. We don't get to things being cast into hell until the very end of this book. Where was Satan cast? He was cast here to earth. What kind of being was Satan? He was an archangel. Not just an angel, even though angels are more powerful than human beings. He was an archangel, meaning he was a higher ranking angel in the taxonomy of angels. He's the highest powerful spiritual being that exists on planet earth today. So what authority does he have to give to this Antichrist character? The authority to rule all the earth. That's why, you, you, and of course, John, in the first century, he's looking at a worldwide government. He's thinking of a restored Roman Empire. Why? Because Rome ruled the world. 
Has anybody ever heard the phrase, all roads lead to? Somebody's got to say it. All roads lead to Rome. Do you know why they said that? Because it actually did back in the day. Rome built all of the roads. You know what I love about that phrase, Sherita? All roads lead to Rome. And do you know what left from Rome to go to the rest of the world? The gospel. Jesus waited for that right time when all of the world was interconnected enough, the entire world, and Rome paid and laid down the roads that Paul and Silas and Timothy and all of the apostles used to spread the gospel. I love that. All right, first question. Has Satan had people in history ready to go as the Antichrist? Sure. Somebody else asked that question? All right. Fantastic. This, the reason I say that is this is one of these conversations my wife and I have all the time. So let's, let's, let's process this question. We're talking about Satan's authority. Does Satan know the future? No, he does not. How do we know that Satan doesn't know the future? Is Satan equal to God? No. See, now here's the difference between your Christian worldview and your Eastern dualism worldview, right? So if you came from the East, an Eastern mentality, anybody ever seen the yin-yang symbol? It's like super popular on skateboards when I was a kid. So yin and yang is the idea that good and evil have to be completely equal. That's a pagan concept. That's not a Christian concept. In the pagan society, good and evil are equals, and there's a little good in all the evil, and there's a little evil in all the good, and that's, that yin, that's what that yin and yang symbol represents. That is a pagan philosophy. That is not a Christian idea. In a Christian worldview, there is only one being that is all-powerful, omnipresent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent. His name is God. Satan is not equal to God. He is not omnipresent. He can't be in all places. He is not omnipotent. He's not all-powerful. He's not omniscient. He doesn't know all things. And he's not omnibenevolent. He's not all-loving. Satan is a created creature. So if Satan does not know the future, but he's also read the very book that you and I are reading, right? Because he was, he was there. He was there when it was written, right? Don't quote the deep magic to me, which I was there when it was written, right? For my Narnia fans. Satan is an angelic being, meaning he's not mortal. He doesn't die. He doesn't age. He was around when John wrote this the first time. So he knows what's coming. And he can't know the future. So he can't know the date and the time that God has selected for the end of the world. So how does Satan have an antichrist character ready to jump on the scene with this one worldwide government? My best answer, Satan always has had an antichrist character waiting in the wings of secular government to be used at the right time. Because what is his ultimate goal? Satan wants to be worshipped the way God is worshipped. That was his original problem. And I will ascend to the mountain of God and I will be like God. That was his original sin and he's been trying to do it ever since. So since I know that Satan is not an omniscient being, he can't know the future. But I also know that there will come an antichrist character who will rule the world. I conclude that Satan must always be prepared to have an antichrist character rise up and rule because there's going to be one, but Satan, Satan's not allowed to know the future in the same way that God does. And that's why it's important that when we talk about Scripture, we talk about what kind of worldview you're using, what lens, what glasses are you wearing when you read the Scriptures? I'm wearing the glasses that says Satan is not equal to God. He does not possess God's power. Now, that's going to be a problem in a couple of verses because I'm going to explain some stuff that's really weird, but we'll get there. So, my answer is, has Satan had people ready to go as the Antichrist throughout history? Absolutely yes, because he can't know the future. He's always trying to rule, but he also can't stop the will of Almighty God. Verse 3, one of the heads of the beast seemed to have a fatal wound, but the fatal wound had been healed. This is the Antichrist himself. This is also from Daniel. Daniel's view of the end of the world also saw the Antichrist character survive on what should have been a mortal head wound and recovers miraculously. Yeah, just hmm that for a minute. Because when you, see, when you see this whole chapter put together, what Satan is building for himself is what is, it's been referred to as the unholy trinity. A holy meaning that not unholy, but a, a non-separate apart. Not God's trinity. He's creating his own false trinity. If I create a king character who is a mortal human being who was supposed to die or, or did die and is now alive, what am I creating? 
I'm creating a false Christ, right? That's what the Antichrist really is. He is a false Christ character. So Satan is trying to make himself God, and now Satan has a false Christ or an anti-Christ character who has what appears to be a false resurrection. That which was dead is now alive. He's trying to make a copycat of God to be worshipped as God. That's why when anybody asks, the very first question people ask me, is so-and-so the Antichrist? Whether it's, I mean, and throughout time, everybody, I mean, Hitler, Mussolini, um, everybody in American politics, everybody's the Antichrist. Goodness gracious. Um, people in, in worldwide politics, people ask me, do you think such and such is the Antichrist? My very first question, has that person been mortally wounded in their head, supposed to be dead and is now alive? And they look at me like I'm crazy. And I'm like, but that's one of the requirements to be the Antichrist. They can't just be the Antichrist because you don't like them. They can't just be the Antichrist because you don't like what they stand for. They have to survive a mortal head wound. And that's like the very first thing I'm going to use because the Bible says it more than once. Next question. Satan is an angel. Do angels have free will? How did he choose evil to get cast out of heaven? Awesome question, whoever's thinking this one through. So, uh, the, so this is really like multiple questions. So Satan is an angel. That's the first half of the question. Yes, I agree. Satan is an angel. Do angels have free will? I would say that's explicitly shown in the scriptures because Satan made a choice. He made a choice to rebel against God and in doing, making a choice, thereby establishing that angels have free will. So I would say yes to the question, do angels have free will? Yes, they do have free will. How did he choose evil to get cast out of heaven? The last part of this question is the only part that I'm going to disagree with. And it's, it, it, I'm really not disagreeing with the way you're saying it. What he, what he chose was to be disobedient to God. Disobedience to God is what is evil. He didn't choose evil. He chose disobedience. But when you are disobeying the source of ultimate good, if all good is here, what is the only thing that exists outside of goodness? Evil. Satan didn't choose evil. He chose not goodness. And by establishing that is evil. So when people, when people say, well, why did Satan choose evil? You're correct. Like philosophically, you are correct. Satan did evil, but he didn't choose evil. What he did was chose disobedience, and disobedience is evil. Do you understand what I'm saying? So the, the question, how did he choose evil, is very simple. He chose disobedience. And if we're talking about a free will moral creature who chose disobedience, and then you're asking me, how did he choose that? I can just turn around and ask you, how do you choose to disobey God? It's built into the moral character of freedom. If I am free to make a good choice, I have to be free to make a bad choice. That's the idea of freedom. Now, throughout history, we've debated what does moral freedom look like and how, are we truly free or are we only partially free? Um, I, I, I'm in the camp that says human freedom and even angelic freedom is only partially free. Why do I say that? Because I'm not free to, like, with my own thoughts, change my eye color. I can't do that. I can't just decide I want to be a blonde and all of a sudden my hair changes color, right? That's why we got to go to Jen. <laughs> Sorry, you're sitting right there and the joke was just waiting for it. I can't choose to become a shark, right? I can't choose to change my DNA. Those are things that are outside of my control. So am I a free moral creature? Yes, I am. God has created me with a will and he holds me accountable for my choices, but my choices are not unlimited, right? Not like God. God has truly unlimited free will. He can create ex nihilo. He can speak things into existence. You and I are not capable of that. So if I take what I understand about human morality and human free will, and then I apply that to the way God created angels, are angels created beings? Are they created beings? Yes, they are. Are they fully unlimited in power the way God is? No, they're not. Are we created beings? Yes, we are. Do we have unlimited power the way God does? No, we're not. So in those two instances, we and angels are the very same. We are created beings who do not possess all of the same free will that God does. We possess a limited free will. Well, then an angel can make the same choice that I can make to be disobedient to God. And choosing disobedience when you're disobeying the source of all goodness is where evil comes from. Does that make sense? In a Christian worldview, and I just got to say this, the apologist in me can't let the whole evil moral thing go. 
The Christian worldview has the single best answer for evil for every worldview that's out there. We can explain and define evil. We can tell you where evil came from, and we can tell you the solution for evil. There's no other worldview on the planet that can do that. Atheism can't do that. Deism can't do that. Paganism can't do that. We can. That's one of the reasons why you should understand the Christian worldview is absolutely superior. And this, this question just, just laid it up for me. Yes. So uh, Satan is an angel. He's able to make free will choices, and he chose evil when he chose to disobey God. Verse 4. People worship the dragon because he had given the authority to the beast. And they also worship the beast and asked, who is like the beast who can wage war against it? Satan is now using his spiritual authority over the earth that he has vested into the Antichrist and this rebuilt Roman worldwide government in order to force his worship. So the Antichrist not only controls the world politically, he leads the world religiously. But what is the purpose behind all of this? The purpose behind all of this is so that Satan will be worshipped the way God is worshipped. That's what he's always been about. He hasn't changed the game. Satan wants to be worshipped. So what does he do? People, meaning humanity, they worship the dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan. It means humanity worships Satan. Why? Because he gave authority to the beast, the Antichrist, and the government he represents. And they also worship the Antichrist saying, who is like the beast? Doesn't that sound an awful lot similar to who is like the Lord? Which is all throughout the Old and New Testament. Who is like the Lord? Who can stand against him? That's from the book of Psalms. What is Satan doing? He's trying to make the earth worship him like he's God. And he's using these characters of the Antichrist and in a minute the false prophet. We'll talk about him. So all of humanity's response to the uh, vesting of authority in the Antichrist is now we not only have a one world government, but we have a one world government leader who we worship like an idol. This would be totally normal to John in AD 95 because the Romans worshiped their emperors, their Caesars, as divine God incarnates. It feels odd to us in 2023 because we don't worship, at least in America, we don't worship our government leaders like they are actual deities. We understand that they're human beings. But, but 2023 didn't write this book. John wrote this book in AD 95 while Emperor Domitian was being worshipped as a god. Remember the coin we talked about in week one? Emperor Domitian puts his baby son on a coin and he makes him look like Jupiter and he puts the stars, the seven stars above his head to worship him like a baby son of God. That was Emperor Domitian's kid. So emperor worship would have totally been normative to the time that this book was written. Then verse 5, the beast was given a mouth to utter proud words and blasphemies and to exercise its authority for 42 months. Remember that the great tribulation, the great tribulation is only seven years long. 42 months is three and a half, half of seven. The book of Daniel divides the seven-year tribulation into two halves, a first half and a second half. We are talking about the icky, sticky, bad stuff that happens in the second half, the latter three and a half years, and you see that again represented in the 42 months. Verse 6, it opened its mouth to blaspheme God. Why? Because that's all Satan ever does. That's his big game. Worship me like I'm God, but you're not God, so that's why we don't do that. <laughs> Open his mouth to blaspheme God and slander his name and his dwelling place and those who live in heaven. This is an all-out assault on the glory and the worship of God, trying to steer it and move it to the glory and worship of Satan. Verse 7, it was given power to wage war. What's the it? The it is the beast, the Antichrist and the worldwide government that he is the figurehead of. It was given power to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. There's no way I can, can sugarcoat or chocolate cover this verse. At this moment in the Great Tribulation, the Antichrist, who will be a Gentile worldwide leader who will survive a mortal head wound and have a false resurrection to be a false Christ, is given the authority to persecute and to conquer God's people. Now, you're going to look at me and say, well, why would God do that? I'm like, did we read the Old Testament? He's done it more than once. The Babylonians, the, the Philippians, the Persians, the Assyrians. Why? Because God wants his people to worship him and him alone. And sometimes the only way they do that is when they need his rescue. It's amazing. They get rescued from Exodus. And by the time they get to Sinai, they're worshiping the golden calf all over again. Idolatry is built into our hearts. And in times of persecution and in times of pressure, we dig down deep and we really do remember who God is. Verse 8. All the inhabitants of earth will worship the beast. 
This is everyone on earth worshiping Satan. Now, somebody's going to ask the question, do they know they're worshiping Satan? Because somebody's got to be thinking it. I'm not really sure. And the reason is um, they could be worshiping Satan by name, but just like Satan has represented himself all throughout human history in other false idols and other false names and other false images, it's still receiving worship from humanity, whether they are worshiping him by the name of Satan or not. So before somebody asks the question, I'll answer it. Do they know they're worshiping Satan? I'm not sure. They could be, but do people who worship false gods now know they're worshiping Satan? Not really, but they still worship them. All right, next question. How does, bla- how does Satan blaspheme all in heaven if heaven is not open yet? Okay, great question. Uh, we are talking about, where is it? Verse 6, right? Verse 6 says, it opened its mouth and it, to blaspheme God, to slander his name and his dwelling place and all those who live in heaven. Um, he's not slandering human beings who live in heaven. He's slandering the angelic host. He's slandering the faithful angels. Now, interestingly enough, in verse 6, we saw that the martyrs were held beneath the altar in God. So there could, I'll say is there could be, but you're right, not all of humanity lives in heaven because there's still a whole bunch of humanity on earth worshiping Satan at this time. What he's really um, worship, or what he's really blaspheming, he's blaspheming true worship because what he wants is false worship. He's blaspheming the the true worship that the angels give to God in heaven. He's blaspheming the true worship that um, the faithful who have already died, and and if they are in paradise, they're also worshiping God. He's blaspheming the worship that God gets from all of his faithful creatures, whether they be human being or angelic. Why? Because it drives him nuts that he doesn't get the worship that he wants. Why do you think what's the number one thing that Satan uses on earth in order to draw people away from God? Self-worship. I'll give you fame. I'll give you money. I'll give you power. I'll give you authority. Why? Because you want to be worshipped. Where do you think that comes from? It comes from the very heart of Satan himself who wants to be worshipped. Um, so then we get to verse 8. All the inhabitants of earth will worship the beast. Verse 9. Whoever has ears, let him hear. Anytime you hear that in Scripture, that's literally the author of Scripture going, yo, Look at what I'm about to say. This is like super important. It's not what was just said. It's what's about to be said. It's whoever has ears, let him hear what I'm about to say. That's like the subtext there. So the verse nine, whoever has ears, let him hear is supposed to bring your focus to verse 10. If anyone goes, uh, if anyone goes into captivity, into captivity, they will go. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, they will be killed. That's what he wants you to hear. That's where John is bringing the focus. What is he saying? The authority of the Antichrist and the Gentile worldwide government that he will have will be supreme. If he wants to kill you, he will. If he wants to jail you, he will. And God will let him do it. Now, uh, if you look at the outline, you know the piece of paper that I put in your bulletins? Here's why I give you these outlines, because sometimes outlining a text can show you something that reading it doesn't show you. If you look at the outline I gave you here, and at the very bottom I gave you that ABCD structure, the outline of this chapter is very visible. It's very predictable. The very first part, you have A, calling the first beast, B, worshiping of the Antichrist, C, authority of the Antichrist, and then in the middle, you have this one verse, calling for the endurance of the faithful people. And then after it, you have another A, B, C. We have the calling of a second beast, the, fall, uh, the second beast leading the false worship of the Antichrist, and the control or, or the authority of commerce through the, the mark of the beast. Do you see how it's A, B, C, and A, B, C, and there's one piece right here in the middle? It's almost like the two ABCs are pointing you exactly what John is saying. He who has ears, let him hear. For all of you who are faithful, persecution is going to suck to suck. Or for those of you who are in the military, I'll use your military term, embrace the suck, right? What what John is telling us in chapter 3 is where the authority of this, this Antichrist character is coming from, where the authority of the second beast, the false prophet who we're about to look at, where that comes from. But sandwiched right in the middle is, for those who are on earth at this time, yes, he will have the authority to jail you. Yes, he will have the authority to murder you. But the book's not done yet. (laughs) Don't forget, this isn't the end. This is just the middle. So we get to verse 10, that verse 9 points us to verse 10. If anyone who's going to captivity and activity, anyone who's to be killed, they'll be killed. 
And then, he, then he even tells us, this calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of God's people. Hold on. Don't give up. Then in verse 11, now we start the second set of the ABCs. Then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon. So again, this second beast is another, another uh, person. It's the, what's called the, um, the false prophet. or, or um, False prophet is probably the best term I can use for it. Um, and he comes from the, you notice he came from the earth, whereas the first beast came from the sea. So the sea represents Gentile governing authority. The earth or the wilderness, he is the um, false religious authority. So in the end of this world scenario, there's going to be a one worldwide government that's going to rule governmentally, civilly, officially, legally, but is also going to rule religiously. What is Satan setting up? He's setting up a false theocracy with him as God. That's why you got to keep zooming that telephoto lens out to see how all these characters fit together. They fit together because what Satan wants is all of the world to worship him like he's God. And he's going to give you a false Christ character. And he's going to give you a false high priest character. And they are going to lead in ruling in his name and religion in his name to create this false trinity. The Antichrist is the false Christ. The false prophet is the false Holy Spirit. He who directs worship to the Antichrist, and the Antichrist directs worship to God. You see how that works? When you put these three characters together, they're a false trinity with Satan replacing God. So, then I saw a second beast coming out of the earth. It had two horns like a lamb, but it spoke like a dragon, trying to look like Christ, but speak like the devil. Twelve, it, meaning the false prophet, the second beast, it exercised... Um, That was already in, okay. It exercised all authority of the first beast, meaning the false prophet has all the same authority that the Antichrist has. What kind of authority does the Antichrist have? Where did the Antichrist get his authority? From Satan. And were there any limits on the authority that Satan gave to the Antichrist? No, he gave him all of his authority. So if the Antichrist now gives all his authority to the false prophet, how much authority is over here? The same authority that Satan has. Do you see what he's just done? He's created three beings who all have the same level of authority, who are all focused on worshiping him, just like a false trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit all possess the same level of authority. Satan is recreating this in a false, unholy way by giving all his authority to the Antichrist, and then the Antichrist gives all his authority over to the the second beast, the false prophet. And now I have three beings who all share the same authority, whose goal is to bring worship to Satan. Uh, exercise all authority on his behalf, and it made, so the false prophet, makes the earth and its inhabitants worship the first beast whose fatal wound has been healed. What is the job of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament church? To draw us to Christ. What is the job of the false prophet in Satan's unholy trinity? To make people worship the false Christ. You following me so far? Right? Then we get to 13. And it performed great signs even causing fire to come down from heaven. What does the Holy Spirit do in the church? He gives gifts. He gives gifts of what? Signs and wonders to do what? To point to the legitimacy of Christ as king. The false prophet, the second beast, is a counterfeit Holy Spirit using demonic power and miraculous signs to point people to worshiping the anti or false Christ to bring authority to or worship ultimately to Satan. Verse 14, because of the signs, it was given power to perform on behalf of the first beast. Where did the power come from? Satan. Satan gave the power to the Antichrist, the first beast. First beast gives the power to the... And what does he do? He uses demonic power to bring worship to here, ultimately to reflect worship to here. Uh, It deceived the inhabitants of the earth. It ordered them to set up an image in honor of the beast who was wounded by the sword and yet lived. The false prophet or the second beast uses demonic power to exalt the Antichrist as the worshipped king of kings. Sounds an awful lot like a false Jesus. Um, And again, that's why we keep repeating that theme of wounded and lived, wounded and lived, because Satan is trying to recreate a false resurrected king. He can't make a real king. 
He can't make a real forever king because Satan can't make God. Satan doesn't have all God's powers, but he's going to do his absolute best to create this entire false trinity and false worship. Uh, 15, the second beast, that's the false prophet, the guy over here. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image of the first beast so that the image could speak and cause all who refused to worship the image to be killed. So here's one that I got to be honest. The interpretation is a little difficult to understand. So let's break this down. The second beast, that's the false prophet, is given power from where? From Satan. So that means he has demonic power to give breath to the image of the first beast. Now let's ask a simple question. Does Satan have all the same powers that God has? No, he does not. Does Satan have the power to give life? No, he does not. That's nowhere in Scripture. Who is the only being capable of making life? God is. So when, it, when this says, has the power to give breath to the image of the first beast, um, I have to remember I'm reading what John, John describes of what he sees. So from John's first century perspective, the false prophet is able to give breath to whatever this image is. We also don't know what the image is. In his day, it could have been a statue. It could have been a coin. Um, in our day, it could have also been like, like, a, like an AI robotic kind of thing, right? Whatever it is, it's not actually the Antichrist. It's an image of the Antichrist. I mean, today with our, our like deep fake technology, I can get a video of Jerry singing songs that he's never sang, which would be way cool, by the way. You know, I think we should get a video of Jerry dressed as the greatest showman, right? So I'll be honest with you, verse 15 is puzzling because scripture shows me that Satan does not have the power to give life, but it also shows me that he is the most capable deceiver in all the universe. So this has power to give breath to the first image of the beast. Then if I'm trying to understand why, why, does, why does the false prophet have the power to do this, I always want to ask, well, what's accomplished by it, right? If you're asking the why, let's see where the end is and see if I can work my way back to the end. What's the end? Well, the end is to force false worship by threat of death. Has that ever happened in the Bible before? Yes. Famously with Nebuchadnezzar, with Daniel, that happened a lot during the exile period in the Old Testament. So now, let's put it all together. Satan as the great deceiver has given his demonic power to the Antichrist, who's given his demonic power to the false prophet in order to create a false image that has the appearance of speaking like the Antichrist in order to kill anyone who doesn't worship the Antichrist. We're still staying on point with the same message. Satan is using his powers of demonic authority and, and demonic deception in order to either force you're going to worship this false image or you're going to die. That's all. It's the only choices you have. And I know everybody right now is here in that whole, you know, that fourth man in the fire moment. That's not coming. Why? Because if we rewind back to verse 10, verse 10, John told us, if anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword, they will be killed. There is no fourth man in the fire moment here. If you choose to be true to Christ, you choose to give up your life. That is the level of authoritarian, demonic oppression that will take place during this time period. So again, when people ask me, Pastor Bill, do you think such and such is the Antichrist? I'm like, well, um, do they have the power to rule the entire world and kill me if I don't worship them? Nope, then they're not the Antichrist yet. Like, when you really break some of this stuff down, it starts getting a whole lot easier. You can't just call somebody the Antichrist because you don't like their hair or you don't like their commentary on something. We got to have some really key elements here. And one of them is the Antichrist will be the source and the focus of worldwide false worship. And everyone who does not worship him will be killed. Now, I would argue that being killed is a form of rescue if you die in your faith in Christ, because then you're just taking out all this mess and we don't have to worship the beast anymore. Then we get to 15, the second beast. That's the false prophet, the guy over here. The second beast was given power to give breath to the image. We just talked about that. He kills anybody who refuses the false worship. 16, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand. Now we get into it. What is the purpose of the false prophet? 
to force worship of the Antichrist. Why? To force worship of Satan. They're going to install or force this false worship in two ways, governmentally and religiously. So when we get to the latter verses here, we start talking about the mark of the beast. We start talking about the number 666. What are we talking about? We are talking about the Antichrist using his governmental authority over economy in order to force religious worship of Satan. So verse um, 16, force everybody to receive a mark on their right hands or on their foreheads. 17, so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark. This is economic force. It's not religious. This is saying, if you don't play in my worldly demon-focused system, you're not allowed to do business. And with the level of worldwide... Now, what's interesting is the worldwide economy we have today is much more complicated than it was in John's day. In John's day, Rome ruled, and they ruled with the iron spear. And if you didn't do business with Rome, they just killed you and put someone in their place who will do it for you. So this idea of a one-world government that installs religion makes total sense to John. Remember, when our faith was born, we were the crazy ones. We were the ones that said, Zeus isn't God. We were the ones that said, stop going to the temple and sleeping with temple prostitutes. God doesn't like that. We were the weird people. For 1,700 years, we've been used to Western society being founded on Christianity, and we don't know what to do now that society's walked away. But that's a whole other message for a whole other day. Get, buy me a coffee, and I'll tell you all about that. When we get here, this is the Antichrist using his authority over commerce, over money itself, to force false worship. You could not buy or sell uh, without the mark. This is where we get the term mark of the beast, right here. That mark, and throughout history... Uh, and and I'm, I'm sorry, man. Throughout history, a lot of Christian theologians have tried to point out what this is or what that is. Let's just be honest. If the Antichrist is not in power and his worldwide government is not ruling, the mark of the beast is not here. Do you see how when we follow, when we just, Miss Barbara, all we're doing is reading, right? We're just reading and trying to walk it through and follow it through. You can't say the mark of the beast is here if the Antichrist and the false prophet aren't forcing worship and killing people for not worshiping we're not worshiping Satan. Don't make the mistake of assuming you can just jump into one chapter in the middle of a highly controversial book and go, oh, the visa symbol, that's totally the mark of the beast. (laughs) And it's funny because how many people have heard that? They've been saying that since I was a kid. When people first started carrying debit cards instead of cash, or now the big fear of going to a cashless society. Until the Antichrist is ruling a worldwide government and making people worship Satan or killing them or else... I don't think we have to worry about the mark of the beast. Remember, there were like seven trumpets that already went down, and and 50% of the world's population got killed like five chapters ago. We haven't seen that yet. (laughs) So don't jump into 13. Okay, question. Is the mark literal? Um, Yes. I I would say absolutely. In order for the mark to be used for commerce, it's got to be something literal, something that can be used person to person. Um, Does it represent something spiritual? Yes, it does. It represents that I bow my knee to Satan and not God. So it represents something spiritual. But is it a literal physical mark? Yes, I would. Uh, During World War II, a lot of people thought that the swastika was the mark of the beast because they would have them on their cufflinks that was near their hand and they had them on their heads that was in front of their foreheads. Do you see how easily we can try to bend our modern day understanding into something that's scriptural? But we didn't ask, well, I mean, did did, did Hitler survive a head wound and was he worshipped as a god? No. He was a crazy, horrible person who did crazy, horrible things. But you can't make him the Antichrist no matter how hard you try, or you have to keep stepping back and blurring out the specifics of what Scripture says until you're not even reading Scripture anymore. You're reading your own story about Scripture. So no, the mark of the beast does not exist yet. How do I know that? Because we're on chapter 13 and the first 12 chapters haven't happened yet. We haven't watched 50% of the world's population be annihilated when God starts blowing trumpets or when his angels start blowing trumpets. Then we get to verse 18. This calls for wisdom. Let the person who has insight calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. That number is 666. So here's why calculation. In the Hebrew language, letters and numbers are transferable. You can actually find out the number for each letter of your name and add it up, and it represents a number. So 
Ever since John wrote this book, Christians and theologians have been trying to add up different people's names in order to get them to add to 666 so they can reveal them as the Antichrist. Um, We've had everybody from Hitler to Mussolini to Clinton to uh, Billy Graham. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just hear that for a minute. Let's just put those four people in a room. Hitler, Mussolini, Bill Clinton, and Billy Graham. I'm not really sure that Billy Graham should be among those people, but because whoever did the math figured out that somehow William Graham equals the right number, we should put him on the list for the Antichrist. Why not go with the whole survived a head wound? How many times have we read that already? Instead of one reference, let's use five. That's why when anybody asks you, do you think so-and-so is the Antichrist, ask them, wait, have they survived a head wound and are they worshiped like God? Nope, probably not the Antichrist then. So where do we get this number 666? For 2,000 years, we've been trying to calculate this person's name. But remember the very first question when we asked, you know, does Satan always have to have Antichrist in the wing? The answer would be yes. When you start doing the math, right, and you try to figure out who the Antichrist is, you're standing on an assumption. You're standing on the assumption that the Antichrist is going to come in your generation. How do you know that? Always question your presuppositions. How do I know? Because if I start doing the math today, that means I have already assumed that the Antichrist is alive today. How do I know that? How do you have that information to make that decision when Satan himself doesn't know when God has chosen for these moments to happen? So just be careful. Now, what I will tell you is when the Antichrist comes and he rises to the worldwide restored Roman Empire government position and we start killing people, whether if they don't worship Satan, whatever that person's name is, is going to add up to 666. <laughs> Does that sound spooky or scary at all? No, because everything that's happened from chapter 1 to 12 is what I wet myself at night thinking about, not if your letters or your name add up correctly. But we get creeped out about the number 666, like, it's, like I'm allergic to it somehow. You know what's really funny? My wife and I are, are going on vacation in about a week and a half. We're going on a cruise to celebrate our 20th wedding anniversary. We got... My wife has put up with me for 20 years. You can clap again for her. Goodness gracious. So yesterday, the cruise line emails us our room number. Does anybody want to take a guess at what the first three digits of my room number is? Our room number is 6668. Does that bother me in the least? Nope. Why? Because 50% of humanity is still alive. The, the, all of the horrible things that we've read together haven't happened yet. You could put the number 666 on the wallpaper. I'm still going on the cruise. So when we get to some of these things, here's here's what I want to caution you about. Don't take one thing out of context from the rest of it, right? There is coming a time where God is going to unfurl his wrath on sin in order to draw humanity back to worshiping him. There is going to come a time where Satan wants to drive everyone to worship him instead of God. All that stuff is coming, but we don't have to fear it. I'm not allergic to it. I'm not afraid of it. Why? Because if my reading of Scripture is true, all of us aren't here when this goes down. Pre-tribulational rapture, yes! I don't have to be here. Even if there were mid-tribulational rapture, guess what? For all of you mid-tribbers, you're still gone. You don't have to deal with this. The only people who have to deal with it are the post-tribulationalists. I'm sorry, I'll pray for you. (laughs) When we get to this point in Scripture, everybody starts freaking out about the mark of the beast and all these kind of things. Remember, if chapters 1 through 12 haven't happened, don't worry about chapter 13. And don't try to take chapter 13 and twist it into something it doesn't say just because you want to... And here's the thing, and I see this happen on YouTube all the time. People start taking parts of Revelation and try to apply it to this or that or the next thing instead of, well, let's take the whole thing together. It says that this happens, then this happens, then step four, then step five, then step six. Don't jump to step 13 if we haven't seen step three Let's, let's pray about steps one, two, and three, because when they go down, there's only seven years left for everything else to happen. Until steps one, two, and three, we just need to do the mission that Christ left for us, which is share the gospel, make disciples, worship God with our whole being. That's our job.
that make sense? All right, so that's chapter 13.